For today's Health Watch, I want to talk to you a little bit about the effects of stress. And I am going to jump right in. So let's start with a simple definition of stress. Stress has many definitions, but for the purpose of the next few minutes, we want to, I want you to know that the meaning of stress that I am talking about today is the feeling of emotional or physical tension. That tension is a stretching or a straining on an individual, either in a physical way, emotional way, or psychological way. That's the definition of stress that I'm talking about. There are two types of stress. The first type is what I would call acute, acute. So this is something that happens very suddenly, um, abruptly, maybe catching you off guard. And for the purposes of this, this little lesson, I want you to know and believe that acute stress is good. And the reason that acute stress is good is because God has designed a very specific stress response that our bodies go through when we come upon an immediate stress factor. The reason that it's good is because our bodies are designed to do something in those moments that is life preserving. So your body has many functions, right? And at any given time, your body is performing all these functions without your consent or even your knowledge continuously. But in the acute stress response, your body decides that I'm not gonna digest the burger that she just ate right now. I'm gonna stop doing that because something has happened that that blood supply or those hormones are better used somewhere else. Maybe she needs to run really fast. So I'm gonna send all the blood I have to the large muscles in her legs. Maybe she's in a situation where she needs to make a very quick decision. I'm gonna flood her brain with as much blood as possible so she can be hyper alert to make that decision. The good thing about acute stress is that it is acute, it is short. It is not long lasting. It happens quickly and it is over quickly. This acute stress response is what makes firefighters run into burning buildings. This acute stress response is what makes police officers rescue a life in a matter of seconds. And this acute stress response is what makes somebody like me operate at work every single day. When the EMS brings a gunshot wound victim into that ER and they're followed by the police and they're followed by family members and they're bleeding and, and we have to make very quick decisions and we need to decide who needs to be in this very small room, that's a stress response. Our brains are being strained to make very quick decisions because we all know this person only has two minutes. And if we don't make the right decision, we'll be telling the family member, sorry, we did all we could do. So that acute stress response is what makes you Slow down, zero in, and block everything else out. That is what your body does when it is faced with that. When you're driving and someone suddenly cuts you off and without thinking your foot slams on that brake, that's an acute stress response. 
So it is good. And God knew that we would face these encounters. And so he created a way for our bodies to respond without us actually giving it permission. But it has to have a cutoff point. So it has to end. And when it doesn't end, it goes into the second type of stress, which is called chronic stress. And this chronic stress, your body really doesn't know what to do with it because it doesn't have an end point. So everything still happens. Blood still flows to your large muscles. Your brain gets all, all of this power, but you're not doing anything with it. And this happens when you become dissatisfied with your job and every day you have to get up and go to work and you really don't want to be there because you know what the environment is like. Your body is stressed, but you're not doing anything with it. And it can last for weeks and it can last for months and your body is just reacting, but it's saying, but I'm not, getting ready to fight, I'm not getting ready to fight. And through research, we know now that people freeze or people faint, but I'm not doing any of that. So, so what do I do with, with all of this hyper arousal? Another example of chronic stress could be if you have relationship problems and the closer the relationship to you, so if it's your spouse or your child or your parent, it also produces this kind of chronic stress if you don't resolve the issue quickly. If it goes on for weeks, it goes on for months, and you don't resolve it, and the person is, is always around you, it creates this kind of chronic stress. It becomes toxic. So it no longer is good because it's not serving a good purpose. What happens is a lot of things happen. Um, I can tell you that you can get stomach ulcers from chronic stress. You can have respiratory issues from chronic stress. So many things happen that I wish I had time to explain. So if I had to choose just one effect of chronic stress, I choose hypertension. Because one of the things with your blood pressure or, or your heart is every single second, your heart is working to pump blood to your entire body. And it happens so quickly and so involuntarily that we don't think about it. Love God, love God, love God, love God. In that love, your heart is pumping blood to your entire body, from your head to your toes. And in that dove is resting and it's refilling. So your heart rests, fills up with blood, and then it pumps, pushes all the blood out. It happens like this. If someone was to take your blood pressure, they would give you two numbers, right? A top number and a bottom number. Top number is called your systolic reading. And that's what we call the pressure that your heart is under when it is working. When it is pushing all that blood out, that's your top number, that's your systolic blood pressure. And then when your heart rests and fills back up with blood, that's called your diastolic number. That's your bottom number. So most people's blood pressure would be 120 over 80, let's say. The 120 is the systolic. It is when your heart is working, but the bottom number is your diastolic. The 80, it is or anywhere between 60 to 80. And it is when your heart is resting and filling. What happens with this physiologic stress response is that your heart needs to work overtime to pump blood to your large muscles in your body and to your brain. So the systolic reading, that 120 goes up because it has to work harder. And then the bottom number, the resting number, 
doesn't rest. So instead of resting, it works. So your blood pressure can shoot up, let's say 160 over 120. What this means is that your heart does not rest. It pumps, 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 pumps. It's only designed to do that for a very short amount of time. When that time continues and your heart keeps doing that and never takes a rest, what you think happens? You can get a heart attack. But worse than a heart attack is a slow death. So you get a heart attack, heart just stops, blood just stops, no blood to the brain, you fall down, you're dead, it's over. But some people experience a very slow death. So they don't have a stroke, but their heart just keeps working. And because the heart is a muscle, when you work a muscle, it grows, right? So the heart enlarges. It becomes so big in your chest that it cannot rest. So when the, uh, the blood fills it up, it, it, it cannot effectively pump that blood out anymore because it's just too big. And so the blood starts to pool in the heart and it starts to rise up in the heart. And this is what we call congestive heart failure because you are now drowning in your blood. And what we see is patients who come in, never knew they were facing chronic stress, never knew that their blood pressure was constantly high, but all of a sudden they wake up and their ankles are swollen and they feel very short of breath and they have to plop up pillow after pillow after pillow so they can be very upright even to sleep because when they lay down, they feel like they're drowning. So we diagnose them with congestive heart failure after all the testing. And we measure how much work the heart can actually do. And when that number decreases, we need to put in a pacemaker, we need to do all sorts of things, but there's no cure for that. So eventually it takes them out. And it's a very slow, painful, anxiety provoking, death. So if I was to choose one effect, that's the one I choose because you cannot live with chronic stress. Your heart cannot live with chronic stress. If you don't die suddenly, you will die slowly. And I don't want to see that happen to any one of us in this room. So I can tell you 101 ways to de-stress, right? But I'm not. You can go home and you can Google it, 101 ways to de-stress. And you will find a whole slew of very good things to do. They'll tell you, take a nice bath. They'll tell you, get enough sleep. You have so many things to choose from and you should choose from them and you should incorporate them over in your life. But the one de-stressing factor that I wanna to stress today is an experience that I had. Because I think in it is the way we people of God need, need to de-stress. Because remember, what's causing the chronic stress is a situation that is not resolved. What is causing the anxiety, and anxiety is a very weird thing because stress means something is happening now, but anxiety means nothing is happening now, but I'm so worried. So we have to be careful about that one. That is an internal factor that stresses us. So a couple of weeks ago, Amari came home and said, Mom, I'm going to the Bronx Zoo and um, we're going to zip line. And because I'm very afraid of heights, I don't like heights. As soon as he said zip line and he was so excited, I said, I'm going to take the day off. I'm going with you. I need to see what this zip line is, how high it is, where you're going, what you're doing. 
So I took the day off and we went to the Bronx Zoo and we went to a particular exhibit called Treetop Adventures. And the school apologized afterwards because they really didn't take any time to plan the trip. They just wanted to do something really quick for the fourth graders. And they said, oh, this is perfect, let's do it. Everybody paid and they were off. They didn't research what the kids really had to do. So they asked some parents to go and a few parents went, maybe about three moms and one dad. And we got to the Bronx Zoo and they started checking in and putting on all of the gear. And it was so cute, we took pictures and two moms, not me, I'm scared of height, but two of the other moms and the one father paid to actually go on the treetop adventure with them. And the rest of us kind of stayed below, took pictures, encouraged them. They really didn't know what it was all about. So they thought it was just zip lining. Little did we know after they had a little practice run, they actually had to climb these trees. So there were like seven or eight uh, obstacle courses high up off the ground, about 14 feet, no net below. They just had to learn to clip their little selves onto the wire and, and, and just go on this obstacle course in the air until they get to the next one. And each one went higher and higher and higher until they got to the last one where they were able to zip line down to the bottom. So as they all got up there, about 29 year olds, and they saw how high they were and they saw the obstacles, they all started to cry. And you had 20 kids up in the trees, just bawling. <laughs> And I was down videotaping it. And when I saw the situation, I put my phone away and I just started to encourage them. You can do it, you can do it. And they went from one obstacle to the next, stressed beyond measure. And they were encouraging each other and the moms tried to help. But there was one dad that I saw became the dad of all the kids. And so as they went up, they finished one obstacle, they landed on a tree, they had to wait on the tree to get to the next one and all of them were scared to go. And the dad was just encouraging all of them and helping them out and, and telling them, come on, you can do this. I mean, he just became everybody's father. When his son finished the course, he came down and he came up to me, he said, Amari's mom, Amari's mom. I couldn't scream anymore. I just, all I could do is cry. All I could do is cry. And he made it down. And he stood next to me and he looked up and he saw all his classmates scared and going through and he yelled out to them, wait for my dad. Wait for my dad. And in that moment, I realized that if we wait for our dad, when we are facing a stressful experience, then he will give us the instructions. He will give us the guidance that we need in the moment to be able to cross any obstacle that we face. Wait for your dad in Jesus' name.